Welcome to Stories and Stanza. I am your host Obro. I am a poet and I created this podcast to bring you a montage of real stories that make life beautiful as poetry. Some stories are my own and some are from the wonderful people who have chosen to join me as guests and bring their incredible journey. Stories include a creator's passion or unfolding branches of human emotions in the face of failure or unfamiliar chapters from the past that remind us about the richness and vastness of life embark on a voyage of exploration contemplation and motivation with me please join me in welcoming today's guest speaker hi natasha thank you for joining us as a guest oh. would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself for sure so first and foremost thank you for the opportunity for having me on your podcast this is actually quite exciting for me i i was born in perth australia but i don't remember that place at all because my family we all moved to canada when i was at the ripe old age of 2 years and we've never gone back to perth so that's definitely on my bucket list one one day to go cuz you're in australia too right Oh yes I am in Melbourne yes Melbourne yeah yeah so that's also on my bucket list too as well so hopefully there's a day where we can actually meet in a person yeah okay. for sure but I yeah so I grew up in Al- Alberta which is a province in Canada and basically while not born in Canada was raised in Canada and I label myself as a hobbyist writer I certainly am not a writer by profession but I have always loved to write my day job I work in the public sector so I am a government worker been doing so for over 20 years and yeah and, and just happy to be here i i am married um happily married for about 15 years now we've got two boys with us and uh, yeah our, our family has always been been here and we've just always been calling canada home this fantastic to uh hear you have told me about your uh, journey of survival and i think uh, it's uh, very essential for uh, our listeners to know about it um so uh, is that something uh we can uh start uh, with absolutely so again thank you for this opportunity as uh, like you mentioned when we had chatted on rather i had mentioned that my recent publication is a memoir and it documents and chronicles my last 10 years of life and what life has been for me with the migraine condition that i had i had wanted to write my memoir as a way to raise awareness not so much as migraines in general but the migraine that i particularly have and so i've had migraines in my youth like many others around the world and initially like when i started getting them and even into my young adulthood just thought that they were headaches just really bad head pain when i got them and while in the moment they were pretty excruciating they were still tolerable and i had always thought that they were just normal headaches or just some days or weeks may have maybe worse than others but overall was still able to function through life but it wasn't until in my late 20s early 30s when i had a series i i went through a series of medical issues and it all led into or bled into kind of that first night when my husband husband found me in bed in the middle of the night paralyzed and the way that he described it because i wouldn't have known but when he said that he saw me he thought i was done that my whole life was just done because he had said that when he flicked on the lights in the middle of the night saw me struggling in bed i couldn't move on the one side of my body i couldn't speak he said my entire face was distorted to the point that he couldn't recognize me and just long story short through all of that we realized i realized just how serious migraines can be and from that night onward we slowly learned that there are over 10 types of migraines and with the one that i have it's called i, I was later diagnosed officially to have something called a hemiplegic migraine and apparently it was one of the rarest of the rare in terms of the types of migraine someone would have and now that it's time has passed we had all we, we we joke sometimes i joke sometimes that i should have went out and bought a lotto ticket at that time because it, mm. it i was told that out of a billion people in the world who have migraines the statistic at that time and still is today uh, for the most part that only 0.01% of this billion Whoa. have what i have 
So like I said, I should have went and bought a ticket. But so while I didn't win the lottery on that in terms of monies, I definitely won the lottery in terms of rare disorders. And it was from that moment in time when I got the official diagnosis, I would say is where one of my books where we call like the repetitive nightmare had happened. Since that night in 2013, I have fallen from staircases from the top to the very bottom because when the migraine sets yeah. in, it does so yeah. without warning. And so a lot of the yes. time when you're walking, you lose balance. And yeah. there are certain times where I just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time and it just, I just tumble down. So in addition to when the, mi the migraine sets, then I might sometimes get a uh, can as well because you're tumbling down and hitting your head against things. Sometimes when the hemiplegia kind of set in when I was sleeping, my family has needed to basically shake me back to life. And then when they do, when I do come through, there are times where I don't remember who I am and I don't remember the people around me. It takes me some time to get grounded again. And it's really hard to explain, but okay. it's a moment where you really don't know what's going on. You're in a blur and then it comes slowly back to you. And it, it's so amazing that you're writing about this. It's, it's very important, uh, I think. Yeah, for sure. And no one attack is the same, right? But really, if I were to describe it, every single attack that comes, I'm needing to recover from it over and over again. And it's, I think what would maybe resonate most with folks is that it basically is me or anybody who has this likely needing to recover from a stroke time and time again. When it first started, I would have these attacks, I would say once every couple of weeks. And I would need to basically relearn everything over again. And now that I'm older and the hemiplegia is still with me, the good news is that the frequency of the tax have gone down, but the recovery period has definitely gone exponentially up, upwards of six to eight weeks for me to relearn how to walk, talk, feed myself, mm. all the basics. So it's been over a decade. Then unfortunately, doctors have told me I likely will have this condition forever. And it's been, as you can imagine, it's been taxing not only for myself, but also for my family and friends, close friends who have had to support me through this. Because they also have to suffer through to, through it too. While yeah. I, I have the condition, they're around me needing to support me and all of that. And with a young child, it's when I first had this, our youngest was only three. And at the time, he wasn't yet old enough to see me when I first got this. But through the years, we haven't been able, obviously, to shield him from everything. So he has seen me at my weakest, too, as well. And it is, it is hard. I, I think as a parent, as you can relate to, because you're a father, too, yeah. having your kids being able to see your parent go through this is not easy either. And so there's that. Unfortunately, what I have, it's like a ticking time bomb for me. Mm. And to add to this challenge, but it is something that's without a cure because it's a migraine, right? And mm -hmm. while the symptoms themselves might be a little bit more serious than head pain, it is still classified as a migraine and it, and it doesn't have a cure. It can only be managed through medications. But whatever medications that are provided, they also come with side effects. It's, there's that piece to, to handle. So like as I mentioned, my recent writing of the memoir and the publication of my book really was, is in hopes that it is to help raise awareness because yeah. there's no cure. And I'm finding that even the medical professionals, and I've gone through yeah. numerous of them, it varies even in terms of the knowledge that they have of this condition. And so I really hope that the writing that, you know, th that is currently in my memoir mm -hmm. will be able to raise more awareness, raise more attention so that there's more research, more funding for migraines. Yes. And it's, someday... It's like very important to put your voice uh, out there. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I'm, I admire that you are writing about uh, your recovery and that's very important for everyone. In this podcast, uh, I am trying to pick a lot of definitions related to the writer. Like, mm -hmm. for example, it someone says I'm, I'm a novelist, or someone says I'm a poet, or I'm just I'm an author. It works very differently for 
everyone i wanted to hear from you what it means to you so as i mentioned earlier i don't think i've ever really even now technically i've published two books including this recent one but i've never really pegged myself or even branded myself as an author per se mm -hmm. at best i i would say that i'm a hobbyist writer because i really do enjoy the writing process and so when you ask me about what does being a writer mean to me I would say that for me, it's a place. It's a place of being. It is a vulnerable place. And I would say that it's a place, though, that is built only for me and only for you. Because I'm sure, Obrella, like, as you write, you're in your bubble, too, as well, in a, in a safe place, I would imagine, as you're trying to get the words to come to you and be put on paper. And I feel that is something very special because it's something that nobody can take away from you, no matter where you are. And and I think you can re relate to that too. Like when I, I very much can relate relate to that. I would like I'll just briefly share yeah. that a couple of uh, years ago, I lost my father, and it was like very suddenly. As mm -hmm. in, I spoke to him a couple of days back, and in that weekend, he was mm -hmm. just gone all of a sudden. And yeah. it's like we were never prepared for his uh, passing, and mm -hmm. that left such a shock in me like a vulnerability and it stayed with me for months and then gradually i started to channel that into writing i wrote before but i was like not really focusing on anything because it's too busy with life and work and everything but right. that even that vulnerability that brought me back to writing and uh, yeah. then <laughs> I, I can very well relate to what you are saying and thank you for sharing that it's very important that we know from each other as to what writing means for us right oh, absolutely and isn't it amazing what words can do like you describe that outlet or that even like therapy in some ways right yes. where it's self-healing, where you heal yourself. And, and to me, that's what's so amazing of what words can do. It can enable action. It can heal you. And on the flip side, it could also make you angry, right? Like it's and all other emotions that can be invoked. And, and I would also argue it invokes different things in different people. Like it really depends on who and where you are in life. And so for me, it's... and with my hemiplegia, with my hem hemiplegic migraine, it often leaves me with a loss of self, a loss of control. And I think while I've always liked writing, after I had this, I found that the writing kind of morphed too as well for me, where it was probably where it created a space for me where I actually felt I had the most control. And truly, when you're writing, that is where you can be God, right? Like you decide, it's your call as to where you want to take the writing to. If it's a fictional piece of story that you want to write, you decide what your characters will say and do and how they end up, right? And if it's a memoir, you have the ability to place the words in, in spaces and places that invoke strong emotions from people. And, and, and I think it's also probably one of the safest places where you can experiment to be someone you're not and also a place where you can truly be your yourself too. So I also find at the same moment, it's a very freeing experience too. Yes, that is that's very true. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, continuing uh, with that, yeah. so when you began as a writer, yeah. was it by yourself or were you motivated by someone you knew or something that happened how did you start yeah so even as i mentioned I, I i always liked to read and i think or sorry yeah to read too and, and i would say before the writing it really did come the reading right so i always was drawn to storybooks from as early as i remember there was just something special about books and i would think that's probably similar to many other writers right you're drawn to stories and so it started with me with love of stories and then from there progressed to having a hand in writing my own story and so i started writing i'd say talking about elementary time i and i'd say the very first 
being human who encouraged、mm. this interest was my mom. She herself is a hobbyist writer. She, in in fact, my mom's in her mid seventies now, and in Canada we have a local newspaper that she actually con- contributes to on a regular basis too as well. She's active in the Asian com- community, and so she writes in chi- in Chinese, but she has an article that she contributes to herself as well. So I may have gotten. That interest from her. Yeah, that that <laughs> thing. It's really good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my first book, I remember my so-called book.、Um, I was、yeah. in grade one, and my mom made me, or not made me, but she helped me craft the story. We made like a homemade book, and I remember the、yeah. title. It was called "The Little Lost Cat." You can probably guess what the story was about. <laughs> yeah, but it was—I would say—it was my my first children's book, right? Like it, 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 it had pictures in it, right? And it had really short and simple prose, but it talked about this little lost cat. And since then, through my schooling years and whatnot, I've had people comment on how well I wrote. But I never really thought about it. I honestly didn't even think about publishing or any of that. And but I do remember probably in my early teen years. My local journal, the local new—they have a section where you write a letter to the editor. And I wrote a letter one year to the editor. And every month at that time, I remember they would select the best written piece for that month to the editor, and they、mm-hmm. called it the Golden Pen Award. And I was fortunate enough to be selected. And was told I was one of the younger, youngest writers in that cadre to be chosen in that newspaper, and it was really nice. At that time, I was able to meet the editor of the newspaper, and she was also an inspiration to me, in, and tried to guide me in terms of what makes for good writers. And yeah, and through all of these influential folks and people through my life, was where I started to think that maybe I could. Do a little bit more with my writing, even if it is just for a hobby, and get it out there a little bit in the、uh, world. Yep, that's really a commendable job, definitely. And it comes with a certain satisfaction that you can probably not just describe. I, I have something that I that I see in social media a lot that writers have become. Very goal oriented, very objective、mm-hmm. in their mind. They share that ah, I'm writing something this big. This is my number of words. This is my progress. This is my writer's block, etc., etc.、Oh. And for me, I have never been that methodical. If I want、mm-hmm. to write, I write. And if it, and if I feel、uh, feel that I have a writer's block, then I don't. Do you ever set those goals for yourself, or do you find follow any particular discipline? Let's say writing a little bit every day, or journaling, or Or the novel writing month. Do you practice any of that discipline when it comes to your writing? I was asked like a very similar question the other day、yeah. from someone too as well. He was an engineer, and he, <laughs> my friend, was just asking like, how do you get words out? Because is it like that set discipline as you described, right? Or how do these words just come out? And how do you structure things?、Mm. And I'm like you. I also don't really have much discipline. <laughs> When it comes, and it's really funny because I'm usually in my day job. I'm in HR,、mm-hmm. right? And so HR and human resources is all about process, right, and rules and all of that. But when it comes to writing, I've never really got had set anything re- really. I write whatever comes to mind. I sometimes I might think about how to order things sequentially,、mm-hmm. so that. I guess there's some minimal structure, if you will, but overall, I I don't sit down and I because I've been hearing people to not even hearing people when I was in high school, for instance, and they're teaching you how to write a proper essay or a briefing of sorts. There is an outline template that they get you、mm. to fill out or whatever, and I've never been fond of that type of a methodology. It drives me nuts in terms of being <laughs> needing to outline and plan when it comes to like writing, right? Because that just takes the、mm. freedom. For me, out of the writing, and、yeah. and I've just always found it really difficult to do. For me, I like to write freely, right? Get everything、yeah. out on paper, and then go back, and then you can edit or rewrite things. I when I'm searching or going through websites sometimes, and I hear see comments from indie authors or other writers, and I do I can it really relates to me too as well. Where they say the initial writing part is actually not the hard part; it's the editing and the rewriting、mm-hmm. afterwards. That actually is is where much of the brain power has to happen.、Yeah. I、know? I completely understand that. It's very similar to 
how i uh, <laughs> proceed with writing like mm-hmm. for example i would want to write something bigger but of course i cannot leave my day job and my right yes and all that <laughs> that and is so, also a challenge too <laughs> yeah and i've noticed that if once or twice i tried that if i have time off then i just focus and write but that doesn't happen it like when writing wants to happen then it will like you cannot force or discipline that's my take probably it works for some other people but yeah, yeah. i totally agree like even when i was writing my memoir when i first started i was like okay every week i will finish a chapter right like i have yeah. to finish a chapter and sometimes i did and sometimes i didn't and it really depended upon where how mm-hmm. easy or where your energy level was at your inspiration was at in terms of the flow of words because yeah. you know in my mind if the words aren't flowing the way that they're supposed to mm-hmm. there really is no point right like you might yeah. as well just wait until something comes to you and then yeah. you go for it in this podcast is another thing i'm trying understand because most of the people i'm i'm trying to i'm talking to they are as you say hobby writers or indie yeah. authors so it the everyone has their own jobs it's something they are doing on the side and because mm-hmm. they enjoy the process it's nothing uh, about the money yet i'm not people who do it for the money but people have met so far they are doing it as a hobby or as an outlet kind of thing so mm-hmm. the way they see their growth like for example if i was a commercial writer then I'll, i'll see something very differently that oh i have to make money i have to sell this many books or to this much uh, audience that's not what i would like as a creator i would not look at the growth i see that what i write if the, it is that material is that nice that's how i see my growth so i wanted to hear from you that what gives you that feeling of success or what would how would you want to see yourself few years down the line was for me i'm i'm very much along the same lines as you i i want to continue writing because i love to write and i want to continue doing it to your point what you just mentioned not because i have to or not because i feel pressured or have an obligation to do because when that when you run into that emotion and you start feeling that kind of pressure it's no longer enjoyable right and it becomes yes. a job that is not enjoyable anymore and a job versus a hobby could be very different right yes. and and so for me success for me like you said it's certainly the couple of books that i published it was not about book sales and it wasn't about becoming rich and famous right so i could quit my job and just live <laughs> off my royalties <laughs> <laughs> be great if it were that would be definitely be a bonus but it's not because of that like to your point it is because of the the safe haven that writing gives for me and it's something that i feel that i need to protect that for myself and having the privilege and having the opportunity to share it with other people even if it's one person right like i said the memoir that that i recently published even if it only reached one person but that's one extra person in this world who now knows about a rare disorder that either that they never realized it's a benefit like you're gifting somebody with extra knowledge that could be beneficial right and with that's why i I've, if i can i i my first book was a was a fictional story the second publication was a memoir like i i want to keep trying to write different things too mm-hmm. and not just restrict myself yeah. to 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 just one genre possibly even just to have fun with it and whether or not it goes out into the public ether or not that's irrelevant i want to nurture this type of art form for myself in in terms of it's something that helps me feed my soul and it brings me joy and peace and so i want to protect that when it comes to the writing and that to me is the ultimate success of for me as a writer that's really inspiring thank you natasha you, you, we have touched upon a lot of your stories your suffering and your healing mm-hmm. and all all of that but when it comes to your like writing story is there something unique that you would like to share with us 
Yeah, I was thinking about like in terms of unique experiences or like an interesting kind of tidbit or story. And so as I mentioned before writing The Silent Paralyzer, which is my recent memoir, I had also self-published another piece of writing. It was called What Isaac Learned. And I actually wrote that book, wrote that piece of story when I was on mat leave, on ma maternity leave. So it was a fictional story. And um, I actually had started writing that story back in my university years. And, and obviously I didn't finish it at the time, filed it away in an archive box. And while I was on maternity leave one day, as many new mums are on that leave, there was a day where I just needed to do something else other than change diapers and watch really bad daytime dramas and all of that. And so I, I decided to clean out my house. And I, I bumped into kind of this old archive box that I completely forgot about, dug into this. And would you know it? I, I found a draft of what Isaac learned. And at the time, of course, it didn't have a title. But I'm reading this draft and I realized that I gave the name of the main character of the main protagonist of that book, Isaac. And it's the same, it ended up being this, and I realized that it was the same name that my husband and I named our son. So my son, his name is Isaac. And so a lot of the times after when I published it and had people know about it, many people assume that I wrote that book after having Isaac and it was a dedication to him where in fact it really wasn't I had no idea at the time obviously didn't even know wasn't even planning of, of having a child even back then of my own and so I just found it really co coincidental or mm. whatnot but in that moment I felt that it was like a sign that I needed to finish this story and uh, yeah and I and and I did that I just thought that was what are the chances that and it was like a span of over 10 years almost where I put the writing wow. aside and, yeah. and and so I think to me that was a lesson for any writer whether it's struggling or successful or whatever I don't believe that any writing ever goes to waste it's a process and sometimes it might take 10 plus years for you to rediscover it and refine it right and maybe you mm -hmm. need 10 years to get that life experience so that the writing that you inject into your new product or your new piece is going to be that much more fruitful yeah de definitely no, this is really interesting yeah. okay I, I'll give you a small reference. Mm -hmm. This was in a movie where oh. I, the actor says, my father is a poet and he writes beautiful poetry, but he's angry with the world. So he never shares it with anyone. Okay. And I, it's something that I saw a long time ago, but it touched me and I've never forgotten that scene. But back to reality today an author has to do a lot of things like they have to be on social media they have to share their work they have to like market their work they have to tell people what they're writing and many people find that very challenging and it takes the soul out of uh, your <laughs> joy uh, of writing and i wanted to hear uh, your thoughts on that? How, how do you feel about it? Do you do it or you don't do it at all? Or yeah. if you have to do it, then how do you feel uh, yeah. up with it? <laughs> I totally agree. The self-promotion piece, I'm in HR yeah. and I hate interviews, right? I hate going to them for myself because a lot of the times that's what it is. It's self-promoting your skill sets. Mm. And as authors, it's no different. And to your point, especially this age, where technology is abundant and it's everywhere and everything has to be just in the moment, just in time, mm -hmm. immediate. I agree. It is not, you know, especially if you are an introvert like I am, it, it is very difficult. At least I've been finding it. It's certainly challenging and, and laugh when you say it sucks your soul out. <laughs> That's different, but I definitely can relate to that. It does. And like I said, while I like to write, promotion of whether it's your writing or of yourself and, and pr promoting what you've written is, is something entirely different and and it's difficult to do at least for me but I also say though that you know now that I've gone through a couple of experiences with book publishing it is a necessary thing to do though if you want people to know about the work that you've done right mm. no one can ever force you to mm. right but it really depends on what your goal is right if you're writing a, a piece of something mm. and it's meant for your own kind of self-healing 
a process that you personally want to have all to yourself, mm. then you don't need to do the promotion. You don't need, right? Because it's for mm. you. In in my case, for instance, with the memoir, I wanted to raise awareness, mm. right? That was my purpose, to raise awareness of the disorder, to prompt people to do more, more things that I could do on my own. And so when I was working with the publisher that I'm working with now, they mm -hmm. help me are helping me get out there mm -hmm. with social media, right? Book launches, etc. Yeah. Yeah. But I do have to say it is cringy. <laughs> it is pushing you to the yes, limit but of your comfort zone. Yeah. 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 It, and, and I don't know how you feel over like when yeah. you're doing this as well, which is why I feel like podcasts that you're hosting now, even that's, admirable because I could never see myself hosting something like what you're doing which I feel is amazing so I do commend you for, I, I, for doing it, 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 it has started with something really funny as in I, I was not sure how my podcast would sound so but before yeah. I started doing this I used to just record my uh, poem just the voice and I used to publish mm. that and some of my friends and usually I do it like later in the night and some of my friends yeah. were and you see the time difference in Australia as well. <laughs> so a lot of people say that, you know, we listened to your poetry when we were traveling and whether we were in the train or somewhere and it's really nice and we think that uh, you should do it more often. And then I realized whatever I'm doing, it's not staying in one place, it's just getting lost. And I have already lost a fair bit of poetry that I read. So I thought that maybe I structured this a little bit and turned this into a podcast. It is definitely a commendable and admirable venture. So good on you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And it, it's, it's like when I'm talking to other writers and I'm getting to know about their creative process and sharing mine, it's like we are creating a sort of wide virtual family, right? Oh, so for sure. It's... it's yeah, it's very interesting to, I do not feel competitive about writing at all. It's, you see that when two people compete, I'll, I'll give you an, a numerical sort of example. Okay, so let's say two people are competing with each other. And this one is at 2.5 and another say is at 2.25. And then if they compete, then cancel each other out and you're left with 0.25 of value. But if they <laughs> join hands, they have 4.75 right so Absolutely. what we are doing like we are all maybe part of a big jigsaw puzzle and then we are doing our bit and we are fitting into it and we are creating a cultural footprint for time absolutely 100 percent yeah, so which is why it's very really important for me to know about uh, writers. I was writing very actively last one, two years in Medium, but when I realized that people are getting too competitive because there's a little bit of money involved, so <laughs> they yeah. behave madly and I took a step back and then mm -hmm. reorganized my writing and all that. But I'll, I'll never be competitive. I just I, I think that it's uh, more collaborative than anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so we're coming uh, towards the end of our uh, session. I just have uh, one or two more questions. Uh, one is sure. around mental health, and it's one of the burning topics in, in today's world. Uh, everyone is going through their uh, set of challenges and all. And I, I get two perspectives about mental health when it comes to writing. Like some people say that, okay, they are writing only because they are suffering. Okay, And mm. some people say that Okay, everyone is suffering, but it is an outlet. It is how we channel our energy, okay, or mm -hmm. we, we channel our spirit into something meaningful. I'm asking you this because my my daughter often writes things on her own, and she rarely shows it to me. Uh, and <laughs> then uh, she says that I'm writing because of joy, and I never hear people saying, "Oh, I, I'm writing from." from my happiness right? and a lot of people say oh, I write from my struggle and I personally feel that it is important that you realize like who you are and how you your words define you 
okay mm-hmm. so i wanted to hear from you uh, on that you have gone through a lot of health issues and you have mm-hmm. like miraculously healed and all that so how do you see and you being your in your profession you are an hr so you deal with people all the time so how do you mm-hmm. see mental health and writing Yeah, no, for sure. First and foremost, I feel that your daughter needs to talk to my son because <laughs> my son writes out of necessity when his teachers tell him that he has to write an essay and he reluctantly does it and sometimes he doesn't do it very well. But that will be an offline conversation that I might have to reach out to you. <laughs> um, but all of that aside, when it comes to mental health, you're like bang on. It is a a a a trending topic. On the one hand, I am certainly grateful and happy that it is becoming more more of the norm in terms of not a ta- taboo topic anymore yeah. people are more free now to speak about mental health challenges and when it comes to even myself and and the mental health challenges that i've had to needless to say whenever an attack comes or came in the past or even now cuz i still once in a while get them now too in in terms of the hemiplegia it does take a toll on your mental health and that grit and the will that is needed to pull yourself back up again there's a whole bunch of different facets and things that need to come together to give you that strength in the moment to help you push you forward once more to get back up mm. and for me in terms of 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 channeling the despair or the frustration and the sadness that comes through mental health challenges for me it is writing that gives me that outlet to help me do. Now I'm not saying that for me that writing is the miracle drug or the miracle approach it certainly isn't, but it is one of the things that I have in my toolkit if you will, one of the most important things in my toolkit that I have constantly and continue to use as one of the things to get back my strength if you will from a mental health perspective. and if nothing else it is the place where i can find peace and i can find or i can get away from the ang- anxiety and i could be be free to be at peace i don't need to worry about in the moment if another paralysis attack is going to come am i going to not remember who i am tomorrow or do i have to relearn how to walk and talk and feed myself again tomorrow i don't have to were any of that because in the moment i just have my laptop and my words and me typing and it's that quietness that is very valuable i think and it's a gift and i think for listeners to your show it is a gift that you give yourself and like i said nobody can take that away from you right and and so long as you have the ability to come up with words it's within you and to me that's what writing gives to me and no doubt it also helps with my my mental health for sure thank you thank you for that uh, perspective and we are close to the end of the session and i created this this name for this podcast stories and stanza because one part of it was like sharing the personal story and another part was stanza was more about poetry but it's more about like when i'm having a guest that request them to read something they have written and would you like to do that sure absolutely so yeah so this is i've chosen to read a little bit of an excerpt of the foreword piece of my memoir sets up I think the mentality that I was in when I first chose to put words on paper and yeah and so I just wanted to share it with the audience just the last bits here so I'll start now so for a long time I had thought that because of my lack of presence this story would not be worthy and for many it still might not be but perhaps for the few in this world who like me have also been chosen to carry this burden they will if nothing else find comfort knowing they are not alone. Though most names and characters of my recount have been changed, the story I share is real. The voice that tells the story is real. It has been real not only for me, but for my closest family and friends who have watched helplessly on the sidelines. It certainly has been real for many others who have been struggling to find their sense of self in the face of this cruel fate. So call this whatever you deem fit, a memoir personal essay, a work of non-fiction, or a blend of everything in between. There will be things unresolved 
and events likely remembered wrong. But in the end, labels and categories aside, this is a recount of just one person's story. It is the retelling of my story, a long awaited attempt to pick up the scattered pieces of whatever that has been left in a tattered memory bank in hopes that there is still a future for me to live in. That, that's amazing. That's amazing. Is that from your book? It is. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. So like I said, this is a forward note mm -hmm. that I provided to my readers just as to set up the rest of the memoir mm -hmm. prior to me going into how my story all starts about 10 years ago. So, yeah. Would you be okay if we put this in the episode description? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I think sure. it, it would really give uh, people an idea of what this episode is about. And it, it's really amazing. I appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate uh, it for sure. Yeah, and yeah. So, and the last question from my <laughs> side. So, would you mm -hmm. give any advice to aspires or maybe to yourself about your writer's journey? Maybe it's not so much advice because I'm hardly a seasoned writer. <laughs> what I tell myself all the time is keep writing, keep on writing. It's like your DNA. It's like my DNA, right? If writing is what makes you uniquely you. Right. So like DNA, like your DNA, there isn't anyone else who writes the way that you do. There's, there's not anyone else that writes the way that I do. And, and, and that's what makes it all special. Right. And to your point earlier that you talked about the collaboration piece, mm -hmm. that is what makes this art so unique, too, because everything is everyone offers something different and you thread them all together. And it makes for one beautiful thing for people to experience. And I would say, and this is something that I keep on reminding myself too, do it for the right reasons, right? Don't do it because you're feeling pressured or you have to do it, right? With writing, it, it really, to make it meaningful and to make it worthy of your time, right? It should be something that brings you joy and peace, that nurtures your soul, that feeds your soul. So it doesn't suck it right out of you, right? <laughs> and that mentality, I think that's why that even if you get rejected by agents and publishers, right, countless times, it doesn't matter because you're doing it for yourself and that's home, right? And so if that's home for you, it doesn't matter how many rejections you get because you enjoy the process. We say, we hear a lot, or at least I do, right, a, a, a lot about it's not your destination, it's the journey that gets you to the destination. And I think... Part of it, that is what writing is. It is more the journey than the actual end of the day, the book that comes out of it. So I would encourage anyone who, who aspire to write or are writers too, I would share that sentiment with them and just keep on writing. I think the world needs more writers and really appreciate the strength that, that writers have. Thank, thank you for that, Natasha. It was really lovely talking to you. And uh, <laughs> I hope that the listeners will be inspired by your journey, by your writing, by your thought process. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll should do another discussion sometime if both up to it. <laughs> Absolutely. I would love to. But in the meantime, Obra, thank you for the opportunity. It has been a delight. And thank you for the uh, chance to be able to share my story. We talked about self-promotion. It's not easy. It's very <laughs> difficult to do. And so I do thank you for making the process a lot easier to as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Over. Bye now. <laughs>